Okay, we're on uh, chapter eight. Roy stuck to his promise. He quit searching for Beatrice Leap's stepbrother, though it required all the willpower he could muster. One incentive to stay home was the weather. For three di straight days, it stormed. According to the television news, a tropical wave had stalled over Southern Florida. Eight to 12 inches of precipitation was expected, like a whole ruler. Even if the sun had been shining gloriously, Roy wasn't going anywhere. The guy at the gas station reported that the punctured bicycle tire was beyond repair. You folks get a pet monkey or something? He asked Roy's father, because I swear it looks like teeth marks in the sidewall. Hmm? Roy's parents didn't even ask Roy what had happened. Having lived in Montana, they were accustomed to dealing with flats. A new tire had been ordered, but in the meantime, Roy's bike sat idle in the garage. He spent the soggy afternoons working on homework projects and reading a cowboy novel. When he looked out the bedroom window, all he saw were puddles. He missed the mountains more than ever. When Roy's mother picked him up after class on Thursday, she said she had some good news. Your suspension from the school bus has been lifted. Roy wasn't exactly ready to turn cartwheels. Why? What happened? I guess Miss Hennepin reconsidered the situation. How come? Did you call her or something? Actually, I've spoken to her a number of times, his mother acknowledged. It was a fairness issue, honey. It wasn't right that you got suspended while nothing happened to the other boy who started the fight. It wasn't a fight, Mom. Well, regardless, it looks like Miss Hennepin came around to our point of view. Starting tomorrow morning, you're back on the bus. Yippee, thought Roy. Thanks a bunch, Mom. He suspected she had another motive for pestering the vice principal. She was eager to resume her early morning yoga sessions at the community college, which she couldn't attend because she was driving Roy to school. He didn't want to be selfish, though. He couldn't depend on his parents forever. Maybe the other kids on the bus wouldn't make too big a deal out of his return. What's the matter, honey? I thought you'd be glad to get back to regular routine. Oh, I am, Mom. Today, tomorrow is as good a day as any, Roy thought. Might as well get it over with. Leroy Brannett, the bald man who called himself Curly, was under too much pressure. His eyelids twitched from lack of sleep, and all day long he perspired like an Arkansas hog. Supervising a construction job was a large responsibility, and every morning brought new obstacles and headaches. Thanks to mystery intruders, the Pancake House project was two weeks behind schedule. Delays cost money, and the big shots at Mother Paula's corporation weren't happy. Curly expected to be fired if anything else went wrong. He'd been told as much by a top-level executive of Mother Paula's. The man's job title was Vice President for Corporate Relations, and his name was Chuck Muckle, which Curly thought would be more suitable for a circus clown. Chuck Muckle wasn't a very jolly fellow, though, especially after seeing the newspaper article about the police car being spray-painted on Mother Paula's property. Among Chuck Muckle's responsibilities was to keep Mother Paula's valuable brand name out of the media, unless the company was opening a new franchise or introducing a new menu item, such as the sensational Key Lime Flapjacks. In all his years of supervising construction, Curly had never got a phone call like the one he'd received from Chuck Muckle after the newspaper story appeared. He'd never been chewed out for 15 minutes nonstop by a company vice president. Hey, it ain't my fault, Curly had finally interjected. I ain't the one who fell asleep on the job, it was the cop. Chuck Muckle instructed him to quit whining and take it like a man. You're the foreman, aren't you? Yeah, but, well, you're going to be an unemployed foreman if anything like this happens again. Mother Paula's is a publicly traded company with a global reputation to protect. This is not the sort of attention that's beneficial to our image. Do you understand? I do, Curly had said, although he hadn't. Serious pancake eaters wouldn't care what happened to the police car or the gators in the portable potties. By the time the restaurant opened, all that weird stuff would be forgotten. However, Chuck Muckle had been in no mood for a reasonable discussion. Listen closely, Mr. Brannett. This nonsense is going to stop. As soon as we hang up, you're going to go out and rent the biggest, most bloodthirsty attack dogs you can find. Rottweilers are the best, but Dobermans will do. Yes, sir. 
Is the site even cleared yet? Well, it's raining, Curly had told him. It's supposed to keep on raining all week. He figured Chuck Muckle would find a way to blame him for the weather, too. Unbelievable, the vice president grumbled. No more delays, you hear me? No more. The plan was to get the site cleared before bringing in the VIPs and the media for an official gala groundbreaking ceremony. The highlight was going to be a special appearance by the woman who portrayed Mother Paula in the advertisements and TV spots. Her name was Kimberly Lou Dixon, a runner-up in the Miss America contest in either 1987 or 1988. Afterward, she became an actress, though Curly couldn't recall seeing her anywhere except Pancake House commercials. They dressed her up in a calico apron, a gray wig, and granny glasses to make her look like an old lady. Let me explain why you'll be out of a job if this project gets stalled again. Miss Dixon's window of availability is extremely limited. She's due to start filming a major motion picture in a couple of weeks. No kidding, what's it called? Curly and his wife were avid movie fans. Mutant invaders from Jupiter 7, said Chuck Muckle. The problem is this, Mr. Brannett. If the groundbreaking gets postponed, Miss Kimberly Lou Dixon won't be able to attend. She'll be on her way to Las Cruces, New Mexico, preparing for her role as queen of the mutant grasshoppers. <laughs> Sounds like a big role. Wow, thought Curly. She's playing the queen. Without Miss Dixon's presence, we will no longer have a blockbuster event, publicity-wise. She's the company icon, Mr. Brannett. She's our Aunt Jemima, our Betty Crocker, our Tony the Tiger, said Curly. I'm glad you understand what's at stake here. I sure do, Mr. Muckle. Excellent. If everything goes smoothly, you and I will never need to speak to each other again. Won't that be nice? Curly agreed and said, yes, sir. The first order of business was erecting a chain link fence around the construction site. Finding somebody to work in the rain was not easy, but Curly eventually hooked up with an outfit in Bonita Springs. Now the fence was finished and it was only a matter of waiting for the guard dog trainer to arrive. Curly was somewhat nervous. He really wasn't a dog person. In fact, he and his wife had never owned a pet, unless you counted the stray cat that occasionally slept on the back porch. The cat didn't even have a name, which was fine with Curly. He had enough to worry about with the humans in his life. At half past four, a red truck with a camper top drove up to the trailer. Curly pulled a yellow poncho over his glistening head and stepped out into the endless drizzle. The trainer was a beefy mustached man who introduced himself as Kalo. He spoke with a foreign accent, the same accent that maybe a German soldier would have had a long time ago in the movies. Curly could hear dogs barking ferociously in the camper bed, heaving themselves against the truck's tailgate. Kalo said, you go home now, yeah? Curly glanced at his wristwatch and nodded. I lock up the fence. I come back tomorrow early to get the dogs. Fine by me, Curly said. Something happens, you call right way. No touch the dogs, Kalo warned. No talk to them. I feed them. No feed them. Important, yeah? Oh, yeah. Curly was more than happy to steer clear of the brutes. He backed his pickup off the lot and got out to close the gate. Kalo waved amiably. Then he turned the attack dogs loose. They were extremely large all Rottweilers. They took off loping along the fence, crashing through puddles. When they got to the gate, all four of them leapt up against the fence, snarling and snapping at Curly on the other side. <clears throat> Excuse me. Kalo ran up, shouting commands in German. Instantly, the Rottweilers ceased barking and dropped to sitting position, their black ears pricking up intently. Maybe best you go now, Kalo said to Curly. They got names? Oh, yeah, that one there is Max, that one, Klaus, that one, Carl, and the big one is Pookie Face. Pookie Face, Curly said, is my precious baby. I brought him all the way from Munich. They'll be okay in the rain? Kalo grinned. They be okay even in hurricane. You go home now, don't worry. The dogs, they keep, take care of your problem. As he walked back to the truck, Curly saw that the Rottweilers were watching every move he made. They were panting lightly, and their muzzles were flecked with foamy spittle. Curly figured he finally might get a decent night's sleep. 
the Vandals did not have a chance against 500 uh, odd pound of badass dog flesh. They'd have to be insane to jump the fence, Curly thought. They'd have to be out of their minds. The next morning, Roy's mother offered to drop him off to the bus on her way to yoga class. Roy said no thanks. The rain had finally let up and he felt like walking. A fresh breeze was blowing in off the bay and the tangy salt air tasted good. Seagulls circled overhead while two ospreys piped at each other in a nest on top of a concrete utility pole. On the ground at the base of the pole were bleached fragments of mullet skeletons that had been picked clean and discarded by the birds. Roy paused to study the fish bones. Then he stepped back and peered up at the ospreys whose heads were barely visible over the scraggle of the nest. He could tell that one was larger than the other, a mother probably, teaching her fledgling how to hunt. In Montana, ospreys lived in the cottonwoods all along the big rivers where they dived on trout and whitefish. Roy had been pleasantly surprised to find that Florida had ospreys too. It was remarkable that the same species of bird was able to thrive in two places so far apart and so completely different. If they can do it, Roy thought, maybe I can too. He hung around watching the nest for so long that he almost missed the bus. He had to jog the last block to get there before it pulled away and he was the last to board. The other kids grew strangely quiet as Roy made his way down the aisle. When he sat down, a girl in the window seat quickly stood up and moved to another row. Roy got a bad feeling, but he didn't want to turn around to see if he was right. He hunkered down and pretended to read his comic book. He heard kids whispering in the seat behind him, followed by a hasty gathering of books and backpacks. In a flash, they were gone, and Roy sensed a large presence skulking. Hi, Dana, he said, twisting slowly in his seat. Hey, cowgirl. After a week, Dana Matherson's nose was still slightly purple and puffy, though it definitely wasn't protruding from the center of his forehead, as Garrett had claimed. The only thing startling about Dana's appearance was a fat, scabrous upper lip that hadn't been that way when Roy dropped off the letter. Roy wondered if Dana's mum had popped him one. The new injury endowed the big oaf with a disconcerting lisp. You and me got some business to settle, Eberhardt. What business, Roy said. I gave you an apology that makes us even. Dana clamped a moist, ham-sized hand over Roy's face. We're a long way from even, you and me. Roy couldn't speak because his mouth was covered. Not that he had much to say. He glared out from between Dana's pudgy fingers, which reeked of cigarettes. You're going to be Thor you ever methed with me, Dana growled. I'm going to be your worst nightmare. The school bus rolled to a sudden halt. Dana quickly let go of Roy's face and folded his hands nicely in case the driver was looking in the mirror. Three kids from Roy's grade got on the bus and upon spotting Dana, scrambled for seats up front. As soon as the bus started moving, Dana again grabbed for Roy, who calmly slapped his arm away. Dana rocked back, staring at him in disbelief. Didn't you even read the letter, Roy asked. Everything will be cool, just leave me alone. Did you just hit me? Did you hit my arm? Sue me, Roy said. Dana's eyes widened. What did you say? I say you need to get your hearing check, partner, along with your IQ. Roy wasn't sure what possessed him to wise off to such a violent kid. He didn't particularly enjoy getting roughed up, but the alternative was to cower and beg, and he couldn't lower himself to do it. Every time the Eberharts moved from one town to another, Roy would encounter a whole new set of bullies and goons. He considered himself an expert on the breed. If he stood his ground, they usually backed down or looked for someone else to hassle. Insulting them, however, was very risky. Roy noticed a couple of Dana's meathead pals watching the scene from the back of the bus. That meant that Dana would feel obligated to demonstrate what a tough guy he was. Hit me said Roy. What? Go ahead. Get it out of your system. You're a nutcase, Eberhardt. Well, you're as dumb as a bucket of mud, Matherson. That one did the trick. Dana lunged across the seat and whacked Roy on the side of the head. After straightening himself, Roy said, there, do you feel better? I sure do, Dana said. 
good. Roy turned around and opened his comic book. Dana smacked him again. Roy toppled sideways onto the seat. Dana laughed cruelly and shouted out to his buddies. Roy sat up right away. His head really hurt, but he didn't want anyone to know. Nonchalantly, he picked up his comic book up off the floor and placed it on his lap. This time, Dana hit him with the other hand, equally fat and damp. As Roy went down, he let out an involuntary cry, which was drowned by the loud, gaseous hissing of bus brakes. For one hopeful moment, Roy thought the driver had seen what was happening and was pulling off the road to intervene. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. The driver was as oblivious to Dana's bad behavior as ever. The school bus had merely arrived at the next stop. While another line of kids boarded, Dana composed himself as if he were a model citizen. Roy looked down, fixing his eyes on his comic book. He knew the assault would resume as soon as the bus got rolling and he braced himself for Dana's next blow. But it never came. For blocks and blocks, Roy sat as rigid as a fence post, waiting to be knocked down once more. Finally, his curiosity got the best of him and he peeked over his left shoulder. Roy could hardly believe it. Dana was slumped sourly against the window. The dumb goon's fun had been spoiled by one of the kids from the last bus stop who had been brave enough to sit right next to him what are you staring at? The newcomer snapped at Roy. Despite his pounding headache, Roy had to smile. Hi, Beatrice, he said.